Our text this morning is found in Romans 3, verses 1 to 3, and it will be a a continuation of what we started this Sabbath school period. So if you wish to turn into your Bibles to Romans 3, verses 1 through 3. And Paul is asking a question. He said, What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? He answers the question much every way, chiefly because unto them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Jeff will now bring us the special message of justification and look forward to that. May God bless his blessing. Well, I believe we left off with uh, verse 25 in Romans chapter 2, and maybe we'll get to chapter 3. Chapter 3, you know, once he establishes that all are guilty before God equally for whatever sins they committed, and once he's got the Jew convinced that he's just as guilty as a Gentile for committing the same sins, then he can proceed into his argument about justification for everybody, that there's not two different justifications. There's the same justification, forgiveness for sin for both the Jew and the Gentile. So anyway, this is how he's kind of building up to his argument. Now in chapter 2, verse 25, it says, For circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. For circumcision, the word phrase for circumcision... Uh, was the, the right that Jews recognized as becoming a, a member of the Jewish commonwealth. Uh, if we look at the book of Acts chapter 7, the book of Acts chapter 7 verse 8, and he gave him the covenant of circumcision, and so Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised him the eighth day, and Isaac began Jacob, and Jacob begat the twelve patriarchs, and of course the whole idea is that they all became circumcised. It was like the, a rite of passage in becoming part of the Jewish commonwealth. And so when you go back to Romans chapter 2, verse 25, and it says, For circumcision verily profiteth. The word very profiteth. profiteth uh, there's an advantage. Of, basically, there's an advantage of being a Jew, is what he's really trying to say. There is an advantage. If, if you live back in ancient times, were you better off being a Jew than a Philistine? Okay. So, in, in, in the same, it, you're, you're always going to be better off having more light and being in a, a community where there's more truth. You are better off. And, but he says, but if thou keep the law. Um, so, being a member of the Jewish commonwealth, just being a member of the commonwealth, wasn't exactly what God was looking for, was he? What he was saying is that you have an advantage by being part of this Jewish commonwealth, but the the idea was for you to do what? Keep the law law by faith, right? That would have been the purpose of being a member of Israel. It wasn't just to be circumcised, something external. It was a matter of being a law keeper, was the purpose of being part of Israel. So you are favored by having the law, but a mere professional law does not entitle you to favor with God. And therefore, he says, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Being called a Jew is of no value if you remain disobedient to the law. It won't matter. You know, it'd be, our equivalent to that would probably be keeping Sabbath. But if keeping Sabbath, we're just going to keep sinning, what good will Sabbath keeping do for you if you keep living in sin? I mean, it's it's a fair argument, isn't it? No external ceremonies will save you. So what God's really looking for is for us to obey Him from, from the heart. Okay? Um, verse 26. Therefore, if the uncircumcision, meaning the Gentiles, keep the righteousness of the law, shall not His circumcision be counted for circumcision. So therefore, if the, so if, if the first verse there, verse 25 follows, If the uncircumcision, if the pagan, if the Gentile, if he keepeth the righteousness of the law 
In other words, if the pagan himself keeps the moral law via his understanding of it through nature and his conscience, being that he doesn't have the written law, but if he winds up keeping it based on everything God has shown him, has he not shown that his uncircumcision is really circumcision, that he himself really is a believer, and that that's actually what God's looking for? So shall not his uncircumcision, or in other words, shall his uncircumcision stand in the way of his obedience being accepted? And the answer is no. No, if, if the person's a pagan and he's uncircumcised, but he's keeping the law, is God going to save him? Sure. But if he's circumcised by right, doesn't keep the laws, is he automatically saved? No. And this is what the Jewish person needed to understand. But all their rights got in the way and which made them feel better than all these other people who were doing all these external rights. So, so it shall be the, un, the Gentile, his, his obedience to law, his own circumcision will be counted as he as circumcision. So he'll be treated as if he was actually part of true Israel. Verse 27. And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee who by the letter and circumcision doth transgress the law? So that's the question, right? So which is by nature? Which is the natural state of the man? Verse 27, if it fulfill the law, if the Gentile, in other words, keeps the law, does it not judge thee or condemn thee as guilty? Because if the Gentile kept the law and was uncircumcised, didn't even have the scriptures, does that not make the Jew even more guilty? Because if people have way less and they obey God, and you have way more, isn't it likely that, or shouldn't it be that you would obey God even more and do more things that God wants you to do? I mean, that's a logical argument. And so... Um, judge thee, condemn thee as guilty. Um, um, let's look at Matthew, Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Verses 41 and 42. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. Notice that. Isn't that interesting? Because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with the generation, this generation, and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. So Jesus was a greater light. They had more light. They had more anyway, and then... If the Gentile or Nineveh, which would be Gentiles, they did repent, didn't they? And simply the preaching of who? Of Jonah. And if you have Jesus preaching to you, you know, or you have John the Baptist, that's more. It's more. It is more. So now back to chapter 2 of, of Romans and verse now 28. <coughs> For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. For he is not a Jew, the phrase there. Um, so s true separation from the world, which is what God's looking for, a converted heart, not to be of the world. But you're in the world, but you're not of the world. You are keeping God's law by his grace. You're being transformed. And so that separation from the world would require more than mere outward forms. You do not necessarily separate yourself from worldliness by doing a religious rite. Um, you're not necessarily separated from the world because of your ancestry. You know, I'm a fifth, seventh, I'm a fifth generation Adventist or something like that. Does it make you not of the world? It's what you do with the advantages that you have. What you do with the light that you have. Um, neither is that circumcision. Um, so you're not, he's saying to the Jew, you're really not a true Jew. He's really saying that the Gentile who's keeping the law is the true Jew. 
And the Jew who's not keeping the law really isn't even a Jew, not a true Jew. Okay? Now that was a hard pill for a Jew to swallow. That would almost be the hardest thing to ever hear. Verse 29. For he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So the phrase, but he's a Jew, which is one inwardly, uh, which separates that person from the world, is not the external rights, but a change of heart, uh, a change of motives, purposes, having a new life, all of which starts from where? It happens from inside of us, happens in the mind. And it doesn't mean doing outward things isn't the right thing. We'll do all the right outward things if the heart is changed. But he's saying you can do outward things and not have a change of heart. Okay. Most religions in the world are outwardly kept. Catholicism, that doesn't mean there aren't people in the Catholic Church who have an inward change. But yet it's a religion that focuses mostly on outward expressions, um, a confessional, uh, the holy water, the, the, all the various outward kinds of things that are a demonstration that you have faith in what? Ultimately faith in the system. system. And the system gives you salvation. Um, and yet if you just do all these things, you're told you should be saved. But that's really not much different than what a lot of Jewish people believe back in the first century and, and prior to that. If I practice and give my sacrifices and I do this, I'm right with God. And the Gentile who doesn't do these things, there's no way he could be saved. And yet that Gentile out there might actually be keeping the law without practicing any rites. Um... Let's look at Deuteronomy. This, of course, wouldn't have been a new thought here just in the first century to the Jew. This would have been something that God's law would have told or taught. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. Verse 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And you know, in verse 4, chapter Deuteronomy 6, 4, has to be at least one of the top ten verses for a Jewish person. Because that's how they saw themselves different than almost every religion, is they believe there's one God as opposed to many gods. And they call that the Shema, right? They call, it's a, just a Hebrew word, that this is the, this is almost the foundation of Judaism, is that there's one God, and so they had a problem that Jesus called himself God. Because in their mind, when they read this verse, here, Israel, the Lord our God is one. And they emphasize the numerical value of that, one. And yet in Genesis, let us make God in our image. So the whole idea that Jesus made himself equal with God sounded absolutely blasphemous. Because in their mind, there's one. Numerically. And so they have a problem with Christianity having a Father, Son, Holy Spirit. To them it sounds like polytheism. You have three gods. And the Bible says there's one. But the word here for one is the word ichud. So when the Bible says Adam and Eve became one flesh, it's the same word ichud. But it's obviously meaning there's more than one person there. That they're one in unity. They're one sharing a life together. One. So this word ichud in Re or De or Deuteronomy 6.4 is not suggesting something numerical. Like in the book of Revelation, it talks about the seven spirits before the throne of God. That's not saying there's seven holy spirits. But the number seven is the number for completeness. That the Holy Spirit is complete. That's what the number seven means there. He's complete in his ministry. It's not like there's seven spirits numerically. But the Holy Spirit, the seventh spirit, he's complete. He's before the throne of God, ready to always make us complete in Jesus Christ. He's fully capable of this. If we only let him, that's what it's meaning. 
And yet, so Deuteronomy 6.4, the Lord God is one, and so they took it numerically as meaning singularly one personality. And yet in Genesis, over 30 times, the name of God is mentioned, but it's always the word Elohim. Uh, it's never the word El. El is God, but Elohim's the plural of God. And it's not like the word El for God wasn't in Moses' vocabulary. vocabulary. It was. He was simply inspired to use the word Elohim, which is the plural. It'd be like we say car or cars. And in Hebrew, it'd be like car or karim, cars. And so when you see I am, I, an I and an M at the end of a Hebrew word, that's the plural form of it. So right there in Genesis, it's already telling you what? There's more than one personality there. And rabbis have just, they just don't know what to do with chapter one of Genesis. It's the whole be beginning of the Bible. And so this is one of the, the things that they, they had a, a problem with Jesus. So they, they really did think he was speaking blasphemously. But see, this is why you can't have error. This is why truth means everything. Because you get into error, they partly rejected Jesus for a misunderstanding of just this one verse, Deuteronomy 6.4. And then Deuteronomy chapter 10, but when we read verse 5, what was God really looking for? He's looking for the heart. He's looking for them to love God with all their heart, mind, and soul. So it wasn't just some outward obedience to God in Deuteronomy chapter 10. So when the Jew boasted that he had the law, that he had the Old Testament, well, what does the Old Testament say? God wasn't interested in all their sacrifices. What was he interested in? In their heart. So the very thing they boasted about told them that they couldn't have a, become saved just by doing outward rites. So when you look at Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 10, 12, and now Israel, why doth the Lord thy God require thee, or what doth the Lord thy God require thee, but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you this day, uh, for thy good. Uh, also in verse 13, verse 20, uh, thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, him shalt thou serve, and to him shalt thou cleave, and swear by his name. So what God was saying of Israel, yeah, I want you to keep my statutes, but what else? I want you to love me. I want you to cleave to me. I want you and I to be in fellowship together. That's what he's looking for. He's not looking for people who just do outward things and by doing those, see themselves as better than other people. It's exactly what, what God wasn't looking for. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30, the very oracles they boasted of. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 14. But the word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest what? Do it. Why is that a verse important to the, the people who guarded the oracles of God? That that word had to be where? It actually had to be in their heart. It couldn't just be an outward form. It had to be the real. It had to be written in their hearts. Um, Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1, beginning with verse 11. <clears throat> to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifice unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of the goats. When you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with it. Uh, it is iniquity, even the solemn meetings. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. 
washing, make clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Um, plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, and ye shall eat the good of the land, or ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. So he had this all in the law, and now it's all in the prophets. So in the law and the prophets, God has come out and saying, look, you need to do these sacrifices because they point to the Messiah to come. But they're also telling you, you need a Savior. This is how we're going to deal with sin. But don't mistake him by giving me all these sacrifices. I'm not interested in all the sacrifices. I would rather you not have to give anymore. What I want is simply your heart. Okay? In the book of Micah, the book of Micah, chapter 6 and verse 8, the book of Micah, chapter 6, verse 8. He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So that's more than an external right, isn't it? It's, it's how you treat other people. It's how you treat other people. Um, also in the, in the Psalm, Psalm 51. Psalm 51. These are all in the oracles of God for them to have known that God simply didn't require outward acts. Psalm 51 verses 16 and 17. For thou desirest not sacrifice else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart O God thou wilt not despise. That's very clear isn't it? What God ultimately was looking for looking for. But you see, there's, there's a lot of Gentiles, isn't there? There's a lot of people outside our faith today who are people who care about people, don't they? Who, who open their homes to people who are in need. Uh, maybe more so than a lot of Adventists. And so when Jesus uh, told the parable of the, the man along the road beaten in the Levi went by, and the priest went by, or the Pharisee went by, but the Samaritan, which, which one did God's will? It was the Samaritan. He's the only one that took care of the guy. And so he really, in reality, was closer to the law than those who boasted about having the law. Yeah. Okay. And so let's go back to Romans. Romans chapter... 2 in verse 29 but he is a Jew which is one inwardly not and circumcision is that not of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of men but of God so one inwardly so we looked at some verses where in the Old Testament talked about God was looking for that inward change and it says here in that phrase and circumcision of the heart what would be the circumcision of the heart we know what outward circumcision would be, but wouldn't be the circumcision of the heart, but the cutting away of sin. Isn't that right? Look at Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16. I mean, I mean, you'd have to just logically think about this. If, if God only asked me to do an outward act, and that made me more favorable than all other men. What's that say about God? Right? Then he says, Circumcision, therefore, the foreskin of, of your heart, and be no more what? Stiff neck. What would stiff neck be? Stubborn. Stubborn, obstinate against what God wants you to do. You're wanting to do your own thing and not doing what God wants you to do in the spirit. And of course, that's part of this, this verse. Um, also in chapter 30, verse 6 of Deuteronomy. So we can see where God defined what he meant, the spiritual application of circumcision. Deuteronomy 3, chapter, I'm sorry, chapter 30, verse 6. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart 
and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live it, that thou mayest liveth or live. So circumcision of the heart is not to be stiff necked anymore and to, to love God with all your heart. That's ultimately what God was really looking for. Jeremiah chapter 4 verse 4. Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 4. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. And so they needed to have a circumcision of heart to keep from doing what? Evil. Keep from doing evil things. So that's what God was ultimately looking for. So he's not a Jew inwardly, but he is a Jew who is, has his heart circumcised. Back to Romans chapter 2, verse 29. Um, and is that of the heart in the spirit. In the spirit would mean that not some outward work, but a inward work or spiritual work. And not in the letter. Not just trying to do something externally. Um, and again, the example I used earlier was the Sabbath. That we can keep the Sabbath by refraining from work today. But that doesn't mean we've experienced Sabbath rest. That we rest in what the Sabbath is trying to teach us. The Sabbath is a, is a memorial of God's what? Creative power. So what God's trying to say that if you really want to keep the Sabbath, you're not just doing an outward thing by going to church. What you're doing is you're depending upon my creative power, which we live and breathe by every minute of the day. Whether we're saved or unsaved, we're still kept alive by God's creative power. But if we're going to have a change of heart, it still has to be by God's creative power, which is exactly what the Sabbath points to. That's the spirit of the Sabbath. We are to keep it outwardly. We are to come to the church on the seventh day, but not that alone. It is experienced Sabbath rest, the creative power of God in our life. Okay. And it says here also at the end of this uh, verse, whose praise is not of men, uh, but of God. Whose praise, um, whose object is not to receive the praise of men, but to honor God. So a person could fall into the trap of doing all the externals to receive what? The praise of people. And that would really be missing the mark, wouldn't it? And so Jesus would even address this of those who made sure people were watching them pray at the Wailing Wall, right? And going like this all day long. And receiving the praise of men, but not being converted so that men would praise because when Jesus would heal people, and the guy wakes, walks after 38 years of being a paralytic, who did they praise? They didn't praise the paralytic. They praised God. That's the whole purpose of being healed spiritually, is not to draw attention to yourself, but draw attention to God. That people praise God for how your life has changed. How people praise God for the changes that are happening in their life, whether they're physical or spiritual. As opposed to doing all these things that people praise you. And this is a trap Lucifer. Lucifer still wanted to do these things. But he wanted to be honored. The attention drew to himself. Um, so the rites and the ceremonies, based on what we read here in chapter 2, was to promote holiness of heart. Um, so when we look at being baptized, when we're baptized, we're not trying to earn salvation. When we're baptized, we're not trying to bring praise to ourselves. 
the purpose of baptism, and it should all center around how God has brought this, brought this precious soul to this point in their life that they've chosen to give all to Jesus and admit that publicly and profess it publicly. That's the purpose of baptism. It would be the purpose of us coming together for communion. It isn't to somehow draw somehow attention to ourselves, but somehow it's an opportunity to bring praise to God. Uh, the prayer for the sick is not to be something that draws attention to the elders that go to pray, but to praise God for the results. Okay. All righty. Well, we can turn our attention now. Do we have time to? What time do we? I, I always forget because we. It's always a little schedule here. Huh? Between now and 130. So. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, this would probably be a good place to stop, but we could pick up with chapter three uh, next time, which uh, is really kind of a continuation of this argument, but he's going to get more into the thick of then justification. Now that we've talked about chapter one and the Gentiles, and now that we're talking about chapter two, and that, you know, for Jew, if you're doing the same kind of sins, you know, God's not going to show any partiality. You have advantages, but it doesn't make you a better person. You still got to get your right, life right with God and have that true circumcision of the heart because the next thing he's going to start talking about is justification. But before a person can be justified, he's got to realize what? That he's no better than anybody else. Because in a way, how do we truly become justified if we keep looking down at other people? It's going to mess up our way of thinking about how we need forgiveness. And a person who's forgiven much, what? Loves much. And when we see ourselves as much in need of God's grace as any other human being in the world, then we're going to be of the mindset that we're not going to be partiality ourselves. Partial. And we're going to realize that everybody equally needs God's forgiveness. But this is where, even as Seventh-day Adventists, we cannot put ourselves up here because of our light. We've got to realize this is such a blessing to be part of God's remnant movement. And God led me to this church. You see, we just we have to look at it that way that that we are a privileged people to have the light and we just we're no better. We're just privileged and give thanks to God so that others may join this wonderful movement and prepare the people for the second coming.